Welcome to Life, Love and Light. I'm Veronica Mary Rolfe, and in this third season of podcasts, we're exploring the mystical path. We're considering what is involved in following such a path, not only through the practice of contemplative prayer, but in every aspect of our daily lives. Each week, I will be guiding you in forms of meditation that great mystics of the past have promised can inform and radically transform our lives. I hope these guided meditations will enrich your own daily practice. Today, I want to consider the essential thoughts or attitudes about the nature of reality that are necessary for any meditation practice. And then we'll examine the essential virtues we need to cultivate on the mystical path. Now, I know that many of my listeners are aware of a Tibetan Buddhist teaching called Four Thoughts That Turn the Mind. These thoughts or practices can be very useful in turning the Christian meditator's mind towards divine reality. We might call them four essential practices that transform the mind. As I indicated in an earlier podcast, before you begin your meditation each day, it is extremely beneficial to take a few moments to stand still and say a short dedication prayer or recite a psalm before you sit down to meditate. This helps to create a mental separation from the responsibilities and pressing concerns of your daily life and also to bring you into the present moment of prayer. But sometimes we know that even after we do this, the mind is still all over the place and we feel, I can't even start to meditate. So the first practice that turns the mind towards God is just being aware of the preciousness of this body and this moment. This initial settling of the body, the silencing of speech, and then becoming aware of the breath could be enough to bring your mind into the present moment. But you might add to that the sense of, I'll never get this meditation time back. I'll never get this particular precious moment back, much less this precious life. And with this in mind, we approach our meditation with the sacredness of each moment. Indeed, we approach our whole day with a sense of the preciousness of this life. And we bring that deep reverence into our practice. The second practice that turns the mind towards God is the awareness of impermanence and the fact that we may lose our life at any moment and we don't know when or how. Age doesn't matter. Even if one is young and healthy, we know from this past year of pandemic that life at any age is extremely fragile. As Christ told us, you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man will come. Often this thought produces an existential fear because you realize there's nothing actually keeping you here and there's no guarantee whatsoever that the next breath will actually come. We're all in exactly the same place, entering the mystical path in every meditation session, every single day, because we don't know how long we have. Of course, we must plan our lives practically. We all have to do that. But neither age, nor youth, nor health, nor illness, nor success, nor failure, nor anything else matters on this mystical path. Only the daily journey toward God matters. And every single meditation can take us all the way to God. If we can truly recollect both the preciousness 
and the impermanence of life. This will help to take us into the now. And then we can pay attention and remain watchful more easily. Then there's the third practice that turns the mind towards God. It's a heightened awareness of the fact that our actions matter because every one of our actions produces a result, either good or bad. This is what Buddhists call karma and what Christians call the consequences or results of our deeds. We all know that according to the laws of cause and effect, we reap whatever we sow. As St. Paul writes in Galatians 6, 7, quote, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. So with this in mind, at the start of our meditation practice each day, It is essential that we purify the words and deeds that we realize have been harmful, both to ourselves and to others. This recollection of our misdeeds leads us to consider the necessity of purgation or spiritual cleansing. As Psalm 51 prays, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and steadfast spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall declare your praise. Once we ask God for forgiveness, we know we are being cleansed from deep within. However, we must still be prepared that the results of our past misdeeds linger on. We cannot avoid experiencing these. Lies have consequences. Betrayal breeds mistrust. Anger produces more anger. Jealousy and gossip inflict pain. Revenge leads to destruction. Addictions demand a long process of recovery, and so on. Inevitably, we will have to suffer the painful results of our misdeeds. And that means that upheavals and perhaps even big obstacles will appear in our lives. In fact, Sometimes those upheavals and obstacles will actually become intensified by our purification practice. We will experience more suffering, not less. But, and this is very important, we may be sure that by purifying our minds and hearts through daily practice, we will ward off results that could be much, much worse. And this leads us to the fourth practice that turns the mind toward God, which is the reality of suffering in our lives. There are many forms of suffering, physical pain, hunger, illness, loneliness, depression. 
Not getting what we want, getting what we don't want. There's also the suffering of change. Generally speaking, we don't like change. We become attached to the way things have been in happy times. But these good times pass and everything changes, especially in a year of pandemic. We've seen economic hardships, the death of relatives and friends, and so we suffer. We also suffer because we think of ourself as being a separate and self-enclosed entity. And this makes us feel disconnected from one another, cut off, alone. And so we blame and criticize and judge one another. We draw lines in the sand. We build walls. We discriminate. We isolate. We persecute. We go to war. We don't realize fully enough that we are all created from the same loving source, that we are all children of God, born out of the womb of God and destined to return to God. And we all share in the same gift of awareness. So we have to learn to look long and hard at our own suffering our anger, our fear, our despair. Only by observing the way thoughts and emotions arise in our minds can we see these sufferings for what they are, mental and emotional afflictions, arising from our spiritual blindness and the effects of our past misdeeds. But they are not the essence of who we are. Through this process of becoming more aware of our minds and hearts in meditation, we discover how to identify our own sufferings with the sufferings of those all around us in order to allow Christ to heal and transform us. And this, in turn, enables us to become graced vehicles of Christ's healing and transforming in the world. So our essential practice of dealing with the sufferings and the obstacles in our lives should be this. See the sufferings as part of the path of purification. And if we do, we will become able to bear them with grace because we know we are not alone. Christ took on all our sufferings, the inevitable results of our own sins, even though he himself was sinless. And now Christ helps us carry our cross every single day. So in the midst of really unpleasant or painful circumstances, we continue to maintain the stillness of awareness of our meditation practice. Meeting difficult people and confronting excruciating situations with love, compassion, and understanding. You may be surprised that with this attitude of awareness and compassion, the worst conflicts may resolve themselves much faster than if you had fought against them. The more we hold fast to our ultimate goal, our telos, and the practice of stillness of awareness in meditation, the more we will see our personal difficulties work themselves out, sometimes surprisingly quickly. And what seemed like a big disaster will often resolve itself faster than it would have without a meditation practice, without that stillness of awareness of who it is who is truly at the spiritual center of our lives. Now at other times, especially in times of illness, 
Of course, we have to use all our energies to combat what threatens to lay us low, to fight against it, and pray for strength and healing. But the fact that other solutions will present themselves to us in most situations is very consistent, as long as we continue to take refuge in the stillness of awareness. In addition, we must also cultivate a deep renunciation of whatever happens to us, either good or bad. Renunciation is really about renouncing our spiritual blindness, our ignorance of who we truly are and who God is within us. It's renouncing our attachment to thinking that the way things turn out in this life is what matters ultimately. In the depths of our soul, we know it isn't. If we can renounce our attachment to our own desired results of any situation, then the source of our joy doesn't lie in the situation. It lies in the continual awareness of divine presence at work. Eventually, we will be able to go through a really unpleasant situation and still carry a sense of joy within, a joy rooted in Christ's resurrection that has ultimately conquered all our sufferings and every death. That's the real meaning of renunciation. Once you can engage with the world without losing that attitude of joyous surrender to Christ's presence at work within your soul, then your life will be transformed from the inside out. Now let's consider the essential virtues that will enable us to live such a daring and radical, resurrected life on the mystical path. I wrote at length about these essential virtues in my new book, Living Resurrected Lives, co-authored by Eva Natanya. I will just touch on some aspects of these virtues here. First of all, we need a living faith. We need to develop a vibrant, demanding, and down-to-earth faith that is lived, one that is held so deeply it informs and transforms every aspect of our daily existence. We need to nurture a faith that is not afraid of challenge, of change, even of being severely tested, because it relies solely on the strength of the Spirit. This is the faith that prays for everything, for nothing is deemed too small or too great to ask for help with or guidance about or forgiveness for or divine presence at or a blessing on. This is the faith that God is the very ground of our being and will never leave us to walk the path alone. This is the faith that we hold on to in the sleepless dark night of fear and worry and that we finally drop into out of sheer exhaustion and childlike trust. This is the faith that we cling to in the numbness of terror when someone we love is delirious, that believes an impossible crisis can be turned around and become transformed because nothing will be impossible with God. This is the faith that never gives up pleading and that offers abundant thanksgiving in advance for whatever the outcome of our prayer will be. This is the faith that senses the Holy Spirit operating within all the unsolved mysteries of our life. And this is the faith that knows that if only we could see what is happening through Christ's eyes, we would understand that he's already overcome all evil 
and suffering and initiated the new kingdom of God. This is the faith that believes that light will break through eventually. The stone that covers our heart will be rolled away and divine presence will reveal itself at last. Because no tombstone can ever withstand the blazing and transformative light of the risen Christ. This is faith on fire. John the Evangelist attested that, quote, to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God. And St. Paul exhorted the Romans, quote, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Every single act of faith transforms and conforms us more and more to the mind of Christ. The single-pointed intentionality of the Son, which is to accomplish the will of the Father. When we believe, there is no limit to what our faith can accomplish. But what if our faith feels fragile? What if it's being sorely tested? How can we practice without faith? Can we still hope? Simply said, we can't hope if our faith implodes. We can love when our faith implodes, but it's very hard to hope when we lose our faith. That's why we need to have a structure of a system some kind of tradition to fall back on, a liturgical practice to which we are faithful in darkest times of doubt, so that even when we say, I don't understand, or I have so many unresolved issues, then we still have some kind of trust in the lineage of apostles, of mystics, of meditators, of saints, who have walked the path before and who have borne witness to its truth with their lives. We might say, I can't see clearly now. I, I don't trust myself right now, but I do trust them. And even if my experience may not turn out to be quite the same as theirs, I'm going to stick with this faith and this practice because they did. And this is why the meditation practice of becoming more and more aware of divine awareness within our soul is so essential. When no answer seems to satisfy, when we are in the darkest night of the soul or the senses, when no solution presents itself, we always have our awareness. Nothing can come between ourselves and our awareness of being aware, especially if we turn the light of awareness on that experience of doubt or depression. Because as long as there's a mind to have a thought there's a mind that's aware. It's always there, even in deep sleep, even in death, even through death. We will always have our awareness. And that's why awareness of awareness is one of the most powerful practices in preparation for death itself. And if we can start to see this unbroken continuum between 
our stream of awareness and the divine stream of awareness from which it springs forth, then we have our ultimate refuge. No concepts or arguments necessary. So we continue to practice dropping into a stability of awareness that never moves and on which all things depend because nothing could arise if there weren't this ground of reality. This is the extremely subtle awareness that has never been stained by anything that was ever done by our ignorant, conflicted minds. The medieval mystic Julian of Norwich referred to this deep inner awareness as, quote, the godly will that never assented to sin nor never shall, which will is so good that it may never will evil, but evermore continually it wills good and works good in the sight of God. Now, admittedly, the path of purification we've been discussing is never an easy one. We're becoming aware of the depths of our human memories and our afflicted states of mind that have been damaged by misdeeds, whether deliberate or not. On this path of contemplative practice and purification, we are clearing away obscurations and wrong assumptions about the nature of reality in order to reveal a mind that is naturally blissful, clear, vivid, and free of concepts. This process takes time, a lifetime perhaps, and daily commitment, and also great patience with ourselves. But we will get through it, and there will be light at the end. Eventually, if we are faithful to a twice daily practice, we will gain a deeper insight into the nature of reality. And then reality will start to rise to meet us as a divinely created and illuminated world, as the kingdom of God. We've all had some kind of mystical experience of sensing divine presence in nature, in the beauty and majesty of mountains, lakes, oceans, skies. We've all had some inkling of the path of illumination in deep prayer. But it will never become truly stable until our minds are stable. So this is the justification for going through the often painful process of the path of purification, because you can't actually get to the path of illumination without it. Otherwise, we would only have glimpses of illumination, intimations of immortality coming from the surface level of our mind rather than the true ground of the divine mind. They would not yet be stable realizations. And that is why we must practice so diligently on the path of purification. And in some sense, even when we enter the path of illumination, we will always be returning to the path of purification as long as we are in this mortal body, as long as we must purify our past misdeeds. But eventually, the insight into the pure, still nature of awareness and the insight into the ever-changing and fleeting nature of appearances will lead us from the path of purification and purgation onto the path of illumination. The second virtue necessary on this mystical path is a daring hope. 
a hopeful heart is fed by a living faith. St. Paul promised us that, quote, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. If Christ overcame death, he can conquer anything, even the confusion in our minds. St. Paul was convinced that, quote, creation waits with eager longing, the revealing of the children of God. Yet, we are only too aware that everything we undertake has its element of frustration and disillusionment and sometimes failure. This is because human sinfulness made creation subjected to futility, as St. Paul says. Whatever we make will deteriorate. Whatever we enjoy does not last. Whoever we love must pass away. Nevertheless, there is always hope in the ground, both of the soil and of the heart. Quote, hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We hope for the end of our own suffering mortality. We long to be liberated from evil. Indeed, St. Paul wrote that the entire cosmos is like a woman in labor, suffering to give birth. Quote, we know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. We may be sure that hope will be fulfilled, for in hope we were saved. Yet Paul reminds us that hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what is seen. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The practice of hope means a daily, hourly decision to watch our thoughts and our emotional reactions to those thoughts that play like old silent movies in our minds. When we see our mind descending into dark negativity, self-recriminations, rehashing ancient hurts and regrets, sinking into depression, even borderline despair, we must quickly release those thoughts and feelings, just as we practice doing in meditation. Then our life becomes an ongoing meditation practice. These negative tendencies, these figments of the imagination, are only thoughts. They are not who you are. Do not grasp onto them. Do not give them room in your inn. Do not succumb to the darkness. There is a beautiful saying that I've had posted on my wall for many decades. My children grew up seeing it. Choose life, only that and always, and at whatever cost. To let life leak out, to let it wear away by the mere passage of time, to avoid giving it and spreading it, is to choose nothing. And now we come to radical love. 
St. Paul wrote most eloquently about love. Quote, love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love seeks only to create, empower, and spread more love. It is outgoing, life-affirming, and joyous. It is collaborative, not set in its ways, but always willing to be challenged, to learn to grow. Such love may be gentle and meek, but it is strong and has been tested by fire. Thus it has learned to bear all things in patience, however difficult this may be, because it believes firmly that divine love will eventually make all things well. Paul goes on to say that this love will never end. Prophecies will end. Special gifts such as speaking in tongues will cease. Even our hard-won human knowledge will end. And this is because now we only know a part of the whole truth. We prophesy a part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When we were children, we babbled like a child, thought like a child, and reasoned like a child, and thought we knew so much as a child. But when we came to adulthood, we had to put an end to our childish and self-centered ways of seeing and understanding. Paul writes, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And then Paul concludes his hymn of praise to love with these words, And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. Why is love the greatest? Because love is a reflection of God, who is divine love. We need to fall in love with God and rejoice that God's love is forever, and it is unconditional. God's love is not dependent on how good we are. Rather, we are good because divine love makes us so. This is all we may bring with us into eternity, our love. It is the only reality that lasts and then we consider total trust. Throughout the Gospels, Christ tells his disciples, Do not be afraid. Do not worry. Fear not. And peace be to you. Such a trust demands a total surrender to the will of God. In every situation, every challenge, every crisis, to be relieved of the fear of losing everything. We have to give up everything, both in prayer and in action. We all have to learn that walking the mystical way in blind trust is, in fact, the only way to see. In fact, it is the path, hour by hour day by day. Take heart, said Christ. It is I. Do not be afraid. This total trust is not something we do once and for all. With each new crisis, each new situation, each new arising of fear, we must learn to trust all over again. And in order to trust we need 
a fresh infusion of grace from the Holy Spirit. We cannot trust on our own. Yet the more we practice, the more we experience the joy of having trusted in the dark when the light returns. We also begin to understand that all we love so dearly and surrender in trust to God can never be taken away. For everything and everyone has been given to us by divine love in the first place. All our loves are safe in the divine heart. Father John Main wrote, The all-important aim in Christian meditation is to allow God's mysterious presence within us to become more and more not only a reality, but the reality, which gives meaning, shape, and purpose to everything we do, to everything we are. So with these thoughts in mind, let us go into a guided meditation now. This is inspired by my daughter, Eva Natanya, who is a theologian, a Christian theologian, a scholar, a teacher, and a deeply committed contemplative. So take a position, feet on the floor, back as straight as possible, your palms resting in your lap, one on top of the other. Close your eyes gently. And just watch the dance of the breath through your whole body. Have no expectations for where the breath will show up next. Keeping your awareness over the whole scope of the body. Letting it bring itself into equilibrium. The breath may make a sound, but let your mind be silent, witnessing as though your mind is breathless, watching each moment of this dance that is the breath. Then in particular, let your rib cage expand, making more and more space around your heart. Not controlling, just allowing space by bringing attention to it. And just taste, without belaboring it, what your own deepest personal pain is right now. And just know how many people, how many living beings experience something so close, so parallel to this pain, and this fear, and this hurt. And realize that they are all mirrored within your heart.
they vibrate with you so that what transformation takes place within you must eventually affect them and vice versa. So you practice to alleviate the fear, the loneliness, the regret, the anxiety of all the world. And knowing that Christ has done all these things, has taken on all these pains, has transformed all of them already. Call him to the space before you so that you may look into his eyes. You can imagine that you are with him in the Garden of Gethsemane as tears pour down his face and he sweats drops of blood. Or you can let him be with you right here, right now, in a different form. But know as you look into his eyes that this is the one who has experienced all pain in all time and already knows how it will be glorified. and pay homage, knowing what it is in him that you honor so completely that you give your whole life to becoming like that. And then, as though all your efforts could take form as a bouquet of flowers, or whatever is lovely to you. See that you present this offering of your life, your day's work, your week, your month. Place it all before him and know that he is pleased. And then ask him for help with whatever is your most urgent concern. You know something needs to change within yourself, but you can't do it alone. Ask him for help to transform a habit, a pattern, anything that blocks you from reflecting him perfectly. and then ask him to stay with you and grant you the teachings which can come only from within, the knowledge moment to moment, where to place your mind, how to think, how not to think, how to release, where to focus. Know that these instructions can only come from him and beg him to be with you as your constant guide. And then, no matter what scene you've imagined, know that it is a vision, that you are in prayer in your own time and body, and ask him, along with that vision, to melt into light and come to bless your heart, pouring through the crown of your head like a baptism, cleansing your whole body and mind and speech, and coming to rest within the center of your heart as an orb of pure light, pure Christ, 
presence. This is the mind of Christ within you. And let that light of compassion, crystal clear awareness, fill your whole body. You can become aware again of the rhythm of the breath, illuminated by Christ's awareness. And then still holding the stillness, the quiet of Christ's awareness within you, the awareness of the body and rhythm of breath at a distance, now begin to notice that flow of thought and imagery, memory and anticipation that keeps flowing through no intention of your own. It just keeps going in the mid-ground. Watch it now with an almost casual interest, just letting it be but remaining within the dwelling place of the Lord within you, as though he is watching you, the child, sleep, or you, the child, play. And you now are dwelling more within him than being that child. But you still see the child. Christ's love can embrace and enfold us without getting involved in our stories, even though he knows all about them. So try to find that precise juxtaposition of the unconditional love watching the stories unfold but without getting inside them, knowing they are not you. Whatever happens, keep returning to the stillness of awareness within your heart not engaging in the movements within the field of the mind. And then if there is a particularly strong thought or memory arising, you can take it as your object of investigation in order to penetrate it. See through the misunderstanding that makes you believe in it in just this way. It can be helpful to have your eyes open and still allow that thought or memory to arise. And then ask, where is it? Is it inside your mind or outside? Is that even relevant if speaking of the mind. If it's in the space of the mind, where is that? Is the space of the mind confined to your body? If the memory is in the past, where is that? Or if the anticipation is about the future, does that exist? And if the thought is in the present, has it any more reality than a dream? 
what is there to hold on to? And release it into space, knowing who is watching. Rest in him. Just this pure, loving, knowing, embracing presence. Clarifying and releasing thoughts in your own rhythm as though falling back more and more deeply into his presence. And find again that trust in the depths of your heart that the one who saves all is working there. See his light shining forth, entering the hearts of everyone, everywhere, exactly as he has you, telling them, reminding them, teaching them that he has always already been there. And know that in the oneness of his presence is the oneness of us all. United like rays of light from star to star, each perfect, each unique. And dwell in the patience that he will transform all for us to see. Amen. Please be sure to subscribe to these weekly Life, Love and Light podcasts and share them with family members and friends who wish to develop a meditation practice in their daily lives, especially during this Lenten time of silence, stillness, and surrender. And if you would like information about my books on the stages of the mystical life, Suddenly There is God and Living Resurrected Lives, co-authored by my daughter, Eva Natanya, or information about my two books on the mystical revelations of Julian of Norwich, please visit my website, veronicamaryrolf.com. All these books are available in paperback and as e-books from the publishers and also from Amazon and bookstores worldwide. And if you have any questions or comments about these podcasts, please contact me on my website. I would so enjoy hearing from you. Next week, on Good Friday, we will examine the dark night of the soul that we all experience on the mystical path, when God seems absent and we are thrown back on our own resources. We will reflect on Christ's own sense of abandonment on the cross and what death by crucifixion really involved. And we will seek divine help to remain faithful in the dark to what we have seen in the light. This is a most crucial episode for those on the mystical path toward resurrection joy at Easter. I hope you will continue to join us as we enter Holy Week and anticipate the joy of resurrection. So until next week, I wish you all the blessings of divine life, love, and light.